Anyhow, uh, the topic of the moment is for June 26, 2013, um, Matthew Block's work. Matthew Block is doing incredibly important uh, work and unique for sure. Matthew has somehow been gifted with the ability to discover uh, parallels between human works, written works, and uh, the writings in the Orange Book. It's pretty profound. I mean, Matthew was doing this long before uh, the advent of Google or uh, internet search engines or anything else, and I assume he just used the traditional ways, and as somebody who worked in a uh, college library for a few years, uh, you know, I know the tools that would have been available to him. So, he's, he's got this real um, unique knack for, for discovering these things. And then he does a really good job in com uh, preparing documents uh, which have a layout where you can do a side-by-side -side comparison. It's pretty, pretty fascinating uh, work that he's doing. When I first discovered some of these things, I was a little bit shocked and taken aback, you know. Uh, it was like, oh, really? They, they got it from that? And they, they, oh, that came from that source and blah, blah, blah. But then I realized right away that that's exactly what they said they did. They being the revelators of the Orange Book, the writers of the Orange Book. I mean, they just are very clear about a few points that address this. One is that they would rely on human sources as much as possible if there was something out there that could express, you know, uh, what they were wanted to integrate into the story of the Orange Book, the entire narrative of it then that would be okay. And that's an important point, is that their job was to present, and, and it might have been in two parts. It might have been like parts one through three and then parts one through four were kind of like a little bit separate. But let's say they weren't. And let's say that all the people involved are the spirits that were in, involved with, with creating the Orange Book, the material of it, uh, were really looking at it as an entire work. So if you needed a to take a passage out of some book written by a human and put it in a particular paper, uh, it was seen as an act which was beneficial to the whole work. And so, so um, you know, I've, I've had, I don't think I've read all the uh, comparisons and the discoveries that Matthew has found, but I've read quite a few of them. And they're all just, I mean, it's remarkable what, what Matthew has done. And I'm really glad that somebody did it. And now with, with newer tools, I mean, it's, his job is even going to become easier. But as I wrote somewhere on some forum somewhere, probably Truthbook, uh, I feel that uh, there, there is so much unique to the Ranch book, so many concepts and ideas. Um, William Sadler wrote a paper that outlines, I don't know, like quite a few like 60 or something, just completely unique and to the Orange Book ideas and concepts. Um, you know, for example, the life carriers. And for those, none of those, I don't think uh, anybody will ever find a parallel in any human writings. They are truly pure revelation. And if they were the imagination of a human or a group of humans, well, I'm impressed. Um, but frankly, anybody that could do that kind of creativity um, and was that good of a writer, that, you know, it's just hard to believe that they wouldn't want any credit for it or, you know, want to profit from it or anything like that. I mean, that kind of selfless thing is just, it's just too hard to imagine considering the, the uh, you know, the depth of some of these, the, 
some of these concepts. I mean, what's another concept? The mansion worlds, to a degree, is is one of these unique concepts. Um, uh, the concept of the eternal sun being part of a trinity, and not and, and the concept of local universe suns. Uh, the concept of uh, this hierarchy of spiritual beings who are involved with all kinds of universe government. Uh, you know, the concept of the Isle of Paradise, um, the concept of thought adjusters. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, very unique information that I feel pretty confident will never be found in anything that has been written uh, prior to the Arantia book. Now, recently, I think it was just today or yesterday, today I think, uh, Matthew, uh, through Matthew on Facebook, on the Ranch Group, uh, there was a post there that led off to a work by uh, Robert Norwood, and I'm going to forget the name of the title, it was something like The Man Who Wanted to Be God, or something like that. And in that, uh, he's found many uh, parallels to quote-unquote historical um, you know, historical, what can we say, historical, not, they're not quite facts per se, but historical uh, bits that are used like directly in the ranch book and apparently are found nowhere else. And a few people, including Matthew, are, are making uh, the point that this is very unique in comparison to previous findings by Matthew, uh, in that it is not, these are not like conceptual ideas, but these are uh, statements of historical fact. Well, as I looked at this and I thought a bit about it, um, I wanted to read, I was hoping to find an online copy of the book, but I, I could find a lot of references to it, but I couldn't find the actual book. So that was okay. And start looking a little bit up on Robert Norwood. And it came right across this very interesting post, which was a biography, a little short one-pager. And also, um, which mentioned a meeting between him and Meher Baba, which is a, an Indian mystic, if you want to say that. And uh, somebody who I know quite a bit about and who I have a lot of respect for. He's one of the great teachers, in my opinion. Great truth seeker, lover of God definitely a man of God and um, you know he, he laid on Norwood a pretty heavy rap you know basically you know he could see in Norwood <coughs> a uh, that this guy that Norwood was uh, a very spiritual being and that you know he had he, he would do important work and as soon as I read that, I thought, wow, that's an interesting connection there because I'm thinking Robert Norwood, you know, Anglican priest, you know, 1920s, writing these books about Jesus. I mean, uh, you know, I considered him, you know, conservative fellow, blah, blah, blah. You know, I had some preconceptions about who this guy was. But then reading this, the fact that, you know, here he is meeting... I don't know what the relationship was, but even if they only met once, it's pretty amazing. And the fact that Mayor Baba always was acting like he knew the guy. And so the thought occurred to me, uh, if, if this guy Norwood was on somehow on Mayor Baba's radar, then, and I'm sure... You know, if there is such a radar that Mayor Baba is definitely on this spiritual beings that are on this planet now and then, uh, we're pick, we're you know he's on their radar. This guy now would then be on their radar as well. Now, 1920s would it, that was prime time Urantia book stirrings right there, you know, and. You know, if midwayers could pull $10 bills out of typewritten manuscripts in a locked safe, they could, like, scour, uh, you know, library records and whatever. And my, I think my final, uh, I don't know, assessment or view of it is, is that, hey, you know, 
let's say that my little suggestion, tongue in cheek, that um, the midwayers were giving him something. Let's just say that Nor Norwood just wrote it himself. He came up with this, this fictional novel, and he wrote it by himself. But in some ways was jiving with the real story for whatever reasons, coincidence or, I don't know, some internal channels of history. Um, and the Midwayers, as they prepared their story of the life and teachings of Jesus, a biography of Jesus, they said, hey, you know, look, we can use some of this, and we will use some of it. And in the, the Arantia book, it does say, in addition you know, to the, the one part about using sources for all of the book, they're, they're even more specific about what they use for the life and teachings of Jesus. And the life and teachings of Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, are in a way a little bit separate from the way the other three parts were prepared. The first three parts basically each have an individual author, whereas the life and teachings of Jesus are presented as the authorship of, you know, the midwayers or a group of midwayers, including the midwayer, you know, well, actually I'm going to lose, lose a little clarity here, but uh, the connection they had with the thought or gesture of the Apostle Andrew. But they also say they, I think, used 2,000 uh, you know, reference 2,000 people, their works, words, thoughts, whatever, uh, to write this. And midwayers are, when you think about it, are definitely not perfect. And in my own <laughs> feeling about them, they, I think they're capable of being mischievous. And I don't think they say anywhere that the life and teachings of Jesus Part four of the Orange Book. It was the, or is the, um, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and the whole story uh, all together. Because it isn't, you know, it isn't a, a second by second moment of Jesus's thoughts. It's a story of his life, and it's beautifully told. Now, if they happen to pick out some stuff from a guy named Robert Norwood's book kind of sprinkle into their story here and there and of course so far from what I've seen of the discoveries it's definitely a <clears throat> very minor sprinkling uh, so what I mean even if it didn't happen it, to me it doesn't diminish the power of what they achieved and what did they achieve well they're the first to achieve a truly comprehensive and beautifully written biography of Jesus and also from the perspective of him being Michael of Nebadon, you know, there's just nothing like it. There, there's nothing even close, you know, not even remote. <laughs> now, I think the final thing I'll say is that there are these sort of mysteries, and I'm glad, once again, that Matthew Block is doing this work. Because, like I said, uh, at first it kind of threw me for a loop. Uh, I wasn't quite ready for that to see, you know, to see evidence of <laughs> what we were already told was what was going on. Uh, you know, because I might think of it as the Orange Book probably prior to Block's work. Maybe I thought of it as a, you know, a, a, uh, you know, a divine revelation, uh, uh, an unassailable thing, you know. Or you, you know, everything was just, you know, perfect in the book. But it's not. And the book is not perfect. And the, with something like this, with the uh, finding a book that basically uh, has pieces in it that were used directly in the Ranch book uh, that are of a historical nature, it's very interesting. But what comes to mind now, and what I'm going to conclude with, is that in a way, to me, I see it like a magic trick. It's when it's like when you see a really good magic trick, any kind of trick, like a you know cups with balls or or uh, cards or any other kind of magic trick. When you see it performed by an expert magician, I mean, you just go, "God, how in the heck did he do that?" It's just, it's impossible. It can't be. It's weird. You know, something's, uh, you know, 
it's uh, magic. <laughs> but then, if you get to know how the trick was done, then you just go, oh yeah, of course, yeah. Duh. Right? <laughs> and that's the same way as I see a lot of, you know, what we might say about something like uh, the discovery that here's a, a book written in the 20s that things were pour, pulled out of historical value were used directly in the ranch book. Wow, you know, how could a fictional novel pieces of that be incorporated into what is purported to be a true and factual story? Well, I think it's a magic trick, and, and right now we don't see the magic behind it, but we will. We definitely will. If you have faith in an eternal life, I guarantee all the answers to all these uh, sort of problems, uh, as well as all other problems that you may have uh, regarding the Arantia book and its veracity and its uh, information. Uh, yeah, if you believe in eternal life, then the answer will be known, and I'm ready to, to be enlightened. <laughs> and that's it for this one. <laughs>